In 2011, I moved into this neighborhood and it was something that I had announced and I was leaving Stone Mountain, Georgia. And it, it was one of the craziest things that I was transcending social classes and this created a lot of conversations because I had posted where I had moved to on Facebook and I started hearing from the chorus, those white people are going to do X, Y, and Z to you. They're going to treat you a certain way. They're going, and I was like, where's this coming from? See, my last video where I was talking about how I understand how hood people think does not come from an assumption. It comes from dealing with hood people in several times in my life. Uh, the first time I dealt with hood people was when I was living in the West End. And the hood people treated me differently because I used to shave and they thought I was a cop. This is one of these dudes, his name was Hank. He'd come around there, he'd be leaning over it because he thought that I had a wire on and all this other stuff. So when I talk about hood behavior, hood prerogatives, I know what I'm talking about. It's not some mere assumption. And some of the hood behavior came out to tell me because I had left Stone Mountain, Georgia and moved to Sandy Springs, Atlanta that certain things were going to befall me because I was black moving to a predominantly white neighborhood. There was all kinds of predictions. There was all kinds of things that was gonna be happening. And I'm here to tell you, absolutely none of those things have happened. Since I have been living out here, I have not been called nigger to my face. No one's brought it up. No one has mentioned it. It has not happened. They happen. I have not been rejected for credit or a loan. Hadn't happened. I have not been mistreated. I have not been harassed by the police. I'm going to tell you something. When you live in a wealthy neighborhood, the police don't mess with you. You want to know why? Because the police understand that they're dealing with wealthy residents and they could be pulling over someone who could be a judge, an attorney, or some executive that will write a letter to the head of the police department and get them in trouble. See, this is one of the big differences between hood prerogatives and the 9.9% .9 prerogative because that's what I moved to the 9.9%, to the which is the buffer zone between the poor people and the rich people. And the 9.9% .9 knows the power of a well-written letter to the right person, gets things done, gets things moving. So this is one of the reasons that cops like, I have not been stopped. Actually, I'm gonna tell you a little story. Here's a little story. I had bought a brand new, well, not a brand new, but it, it was brand new to me. It was a used BMW 740i. And I got it from this guy who was all paranoid. So he made sure he took the tag off and everything. So I'm riding around in this extremely fast car with no tag, had insurance. I made sure I called and got my insurance transferred over that car. And unbeknownst to me, I my license was suspended. So I'm riding around and, you know, thinking, okay, I'm, I've got this fancy car, it's a flashy car, so it's, it, it, it demands attention, it doesn't have a tag. The chances of a cop stopping me to make sure that I'm okay is very likely. I understood the game, I'm like you're driving a fast, flashy car with no tag more than likely you're going to be stopped. So I had all of my, my bill of sale that I, I just bought the car, all this stuff. I had it in the visor just in case. And one night me, cause the car was, it was smooth. It was really smooth. You press the pedal and it 
takes off and, and it lowers and dips down. And I was speeding and I got pulled over. So I went ahead and I had my hand on all the appropriate documents and paperwork. And this cop that comes over and she's like, license and registration, I'm citing you for speeding. And I'm like, okay, okay, okay. So she takes my information, which had that my license that I had literally lived around the corner because I got stopped in this neighborhood. You know where you're supposed to be mistreated as a black person. And then she comes back, she says, um, your license is suspended. And I was like, no, it's not. Cause this was around the time that I was driving for Uber. So I had went through all this other stuff. So in my mind, and that's how I answered the question. Cause I did not know that my license were suspended. And this is crazy thing. My license got suspended for something that happened in 1997. So, you know, and she goes back to her car and she's like, you know, I've checked and your license has been renewed since this 1997 thing. And she says these magical words that I as a black person dressed in a fat farm foot hoodie with a skull cap on shouldn't have heard. I'm not going to arrest you. What I'm going to do is give you this citation. You got to go to court, get it cleared up and just drive and be careful. But see, this is what has happened to me in this neighborhood. I've not been mistreated mishandled, called out my name because of the zip code, because of where I live. It, it, th this type of stuff just doesn't happen around here. Now, if I had been in the hood, I probably would have been arrested because this type of behavior happens all of the time in the hood because it's about proximity. When she pulled my information, she saw that I lived on my address, on my driver's license. I lived literally around the corner. So I was in my neighborhood, driving in my neighborhood. Now, if I had been in the hood, more than likely I would have been arrested for the same exact behavior. Why? Because you're treated differently in the hood. And th this is one of the things, because, you know, I, I consistently get this and I get all this pushback from people who are in the hood, who have love for the hood, who appreciate, who like being in the hood, who enjoy hood culture, who enjoy the family bonds and stuff created in the hood, who enjoy this. And I get all this pushback. And here's the thing that you don't understand. You're dysfunctional. You're dysfunctional. If you think that buying beer from the bootleg house on Sunday is acceptable and appropriate behavior, you're dysfunctional. Like I, I kind of get this, this, this little jealousy because there's someone who, who is what I call the borderline hater. Cause see, when, when a person disagrees with you and the way they disagree with you is kind of starts to get borderline on name calling, it's just that quick they'll become a hater. And more than likely I'm gonna have to block this person. But hood behavior is usually dysfunctional because what, is, what makes the hood the hood? Scarcity. There's a lack of money. There's a lack of resources. There's a lack of civic progression. Like, let's go to this neighborhood, which is encompassed by the 9.9% and the 1%. Uh, Google zip code 30327. You will see this is the wealthiest zip code in the Southeast outside of a few zip codes in Florida. Wealthiest zip code. So we, we, there are mansions around here. There are Ferraris, there's Bentleys, there's anything you could think of exotic, for, you know, Lambos. They're here because we have wealthy people who have those toys. And since this neighborhood encompasses the 1% and the 9.9%, it is very resourceful. There is a school not too far from here, Riverside School, which has every option, every element, every extracurricular activity you can think of. Because that school is flush with money. Hey, we need to do this new program. We need to create this foreign exchange program. There's money to do it. There's money to create it. In the hood, 
they barely got enough money for free lunch. So if you're in the hood, you are damned by association because you're going to go to, and this isn't to say that there are not good teachers in the, you know, probably some of the best teachers are in these hood schools and they are go to work every day frustrated because there's so much that they want to give their students and their hands are handcuffed. They can't do it. They got to beg, borrow, steal just to get the things they need. There are no extras. They got to fight tooth and nail just for the necessity, just for the minimum requirements. And these teachers go to work frustrated, mad and angry. And this is something else too. You will peep this out. If you are living in the hood and you have a teacher with children, ask her where do her children go? Because this is one of the funniest thing that these teachers who teach in the hood, predominantly their children go to private schools. Yep. These teachers know the damage of having a hood school education is because the first thing is you're already dealing with a substandard education because lack of resources, scarcity, there's no money there. So you're not getting the best education just because of that, because everybody's looking for the low rent and they're looking for the cheap houses, which means less taxes for the school. See, th this is how the relationship goes because you know, it's like, hey, living in the hood, got that cheap rent, you know, I'm, I'm gonna get me some beer and chicken wings on Friday and that's short term thinking, but the long term thinking is the hood has cheap rent, cheap houses, lower property taxes, less money to go to the school. See, that's that's how it works. Plus, around here, the property taxes around here are insane. Property taxes on this house are like twenty thousand a year. And you like, whoa, 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 that's a lot of money, man. That's more than a thousand bucks a month. It is. And this is one of the economic moats that I talk about because of the high property taxes, because there will probably not be any houses going on fire sale. Well, actually that's not true. During the last recession in zip code 30342, which is just right next door, there was a house that went for 255,000 and literally four years later, that house was back to 500,000. So that would be considered a fire sale. So there will be some deals around here because there's some older mansions that have not been updated and, and essentially to a well Hill buyer, they're not going to buy, they're not going to spend $1.5 million on a house to then put in another half a million dollars to renovate it. So a lot of those mansions and older properties that need to be updated, that have been sitting and sitting, yeah, they will probably be on sale. But none of the nice newer stuff or the updated stuff, that won't be on sale. But one of the things you've got to understand, and you've, 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 you've got to understand, once we're having these conversations about the hood, because you know I've been hearing it for years of what was gonna happen to me, and like I said, none of this has happened. But the Pookie and the Ray Ray, let me tell you, and y'all don't want to hear this, but during this recession, Rona session, call it a Rona session, the hood and the, the crime rate in the hood is going to explode and people are going to prey on people because it's already, because here, here's the thing. When you live in the hood, people are already on edge. They're already on the edge because of the scarcity thing, scarcity of money. People have low wages, lower income, lower property taxes, poor education. There, there's just stress all around the situation. And one of the things that you have to understand is it creates a certain hood like pathology because see the people in the hood, and it's about pride and self-respect, which I get. It's like they don't want to be treated less than, but based upon the scarcity, the scarcity, you do get a substandard form of living. 
you get less services, you get less benefits, your kids get the worst education. And this is all a self-fulfilling prophecy because people are looking for the cheap rent. And also you get at this attitude. I remember years ago when I was living in the boarding house, this dude named James, he was, we were having a conversation. He's talking about living in the hood is good. And all the things he listed were dysfunctional. It's like, you know, you know, you get your little hood girlfriend and you know, she on section eight and she getting food stamps and you can stay with her and then you don't have no rent. Just a completely different mindset that you want to live in the projects with this chick with two to four kids because she has a place to stay. She's getting food stamps and she doesn't have a job. That was looked upon as a come up. And also it's about perspective because when you have this hood dysfunction, you know, like winning a lottery is getting a normal job and having a car. That's like winning a lottery. That's what rich folks do. Cause see, everything gets altered. It's like a bizarre world. It is, it, it's a crazy um, bizarro type world where up is down and down is up. And it, it is fascinating that the, cause part of living in the hood is having lowered expectations. And once you have these lowered expectations, this is where the dysfunction comes in. Because right now, there's some dude who's looking at one of these section eight chicks with her food stamps and benefits as a come up because due to the scarcity, scarcity of married couples, the scarcity of men who are showing, leading by example, that many men in the hood feel that it's perfectly acceptable to live off a woman. I know I'm going to get some bad comments about that, but this is something that uh, a friend and I noticed years and years ago was the number of men here in Atlanta who were living with women because they could not live on their own. This is part of the hood pathology. And also part of hood pathology is stories about how rich folks live because I heard all of these things that I've come to find not to be true since I actually, because let's just keep it a buck. Rich people live differently than poor people. I know shocking rich people live differently than poor people. They take more vacations. They drive nicer cars. They live in nicer houses. They marry hotter chicks. Also, Here's something else that no one ever ever talks about is for the upwardly mobile black man has discovered he can get what he wants. Cause see, it used to be, you know, if you were the best black dude, you got the best black chick. If you were the best white dude, you got the best white chick. Mm -mm, that's gone. If you are a properly situated, upwardly mobile black man, you can get the best chick. She could be white. She could be Asian. She, you, you get the best chick for you. You get the best chick for you. You're not limited to, well, I can just get the best black chick. I can get the best black chick. I can get the best Asian chick. I can get, and this has people all up in their feelings because a lot of black men have begun to realize their worth. Because if you are a million dollar a year black man, the world is your oyster. And a lot of people don't like that because it's about going back to that hood pathology. This is what you are supposed to do because this is where you came from. Newsflash, all black folks didn't come from the hood. I know that's a shocker. I didn't grow up in no hood. I grew up in Alabama. It was more country. Definitely there was a lot of married couples in my neighborhood. There were a lot of my friends who had fathers. I think I grew up in no hood. I didn't know anything about the hood life. There were no drugs in my neighborhood growing up. There were no pregnant teens in my neighborhood growing up. I managed to go through 
almost the whole thing in high school, because I think the first pregnant girl came when I was in the 11th grade. But I almost made it out of high school without ever seeing a pregnant chick in high school. It just wasn't like that for me growing up. And all of you folks who embrace the hood, God bless you. Bless your little heart. Bless your little hearts. Because you don't know that you're bracing dysfunction. And I'm about to tell you something. Life in the hood is about to get harder. It ain't about to get any better. It's about to get harder. Because of this global reset of the shifting and there are going to be more people moving to the hood. And also gentrification. This is one of the things that has been happening across the country. Everyone moved to the suburbs, but where are the jobs? The jobs are in the cities. So what has been happening for these low income havens is white people in the homosexuals have been going in buying property, increasing the value of the property and getting rich off hood property. Now, wait a minute. Why didn't the folks who were living there do that? Cause they were looking for the cheap rent. They weren't trying to pay more money. They weren't trying to contribute to the tax base. No, 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 no. Cause they had the wrong mindset. This is the predominant mindset of the hood. Keep it cheap, keep it real, keep it dysfunctional. So when you have these other groups who are like, wow, man, because, you know, when I was living in the West End, it just used to blow my mind that the level of craftsmanship in these houses, the beauty, the architecture, and these houses were going for like, when I was there, 10, 20, $30,000. The boarding house that I was in, because I looked it up, the dude paid $40,000 for this boarding house. At any time, he would have eight to 12 people in there paying 150 bucks a, a week. So that's 600 bucks per person. If he had 10 people in there, that was $6,000 a month. If he had 12 people in there, that was 7,200 per month. He made what he paid for that house back in the first seven months of ownership. And at that point, it became a cash cow. He got his money back. It became all profit, mostly profit. And this is one of the things that so many investor types saw in the hood that they could go ahead and get this cheap property, exploit that price, rent it out, get their money back and start making profit. But people on the outside who had money, because see, the 9.9%, .9%, there are many people here who make their money from the hood. They have a store, they have some kind of business in the hood, and they have that cheap hood property that's making them all of this bank so they can live over here. See, this is how the game is. Like the, the hood. It's never going to be any good because, you know, even though the, there will be parts that will be gentrified, the central core of the hood will remain the central core of the hood. And it's just not going to get better because there are certain neighborhoods that started off rich and they're still rich. There are certain neighborhoods that started off poor and they're still poor. But this is the dysfunction. This is the level. And like all of you folks who be coming after me, because I'd be telling you the truth, who be get all up in your feelings like Kiki, all up in your feelings. You just all so mad. You, you're just living in dysfunction. It ain't going to get no better. You, you are living in a level of dysfunction that you cannot even comprehend because you're looking at it through this myopic view of being in the hood. And like, well, ain't nothing wrong with being in the hood. They ain't nothing wrong with no cheap rent. They ain't nothing wrong with me. They ain't nothing wrong with the way that I live. Absolutely there is. Because you're looking at it from a scarcity mindset and scarcity principles. You're not looking at it from an elevation. Because, you know, once I moved here, my life has been on the upward track. Because, you know, your environment produces either a good you or a bad you. 
And if you're living in the hood environment, like go ahead and give you an example of the hood environment. Only fans. There was this dude on Instagram that created this thing called Demon Time, where he would bring people onto his Instagram live. Well, women and they would wear a mask and they would strip and they would put up their cash app. That's very much hood activity. And you had all these girls who were just doing something. They had never been strippers before. They're just shaking their booties, making that money and all this other stuff to the point Instagram banned demon time. Go ahead and Google it up. And now they they're on their own only fans. Pure hood behavior because the guy who started it was a club promoter and typically that type of behavior can get you a lot of money but you're never going to become a multi-millionaire from that type of behavior unless you start selling drugs then yeah that can happen but this whole fascination and appreciation with the hood is a recent development because Back in the day, there were a lot of Florida Evans types. Yeah, we poor, but we're not going to participate in this debauchery. This is one of this was once upon a time there were poor people who wore very clean clothes, kept clean house, kept the yard cut, and they were poor, but they had pride and respect for themselves. That's gone now with hood culture and the appropriation of all of these bad elements. And this craziness and this madness. So come on at me and let me know and tell me all this other stuff about how good the hood is. And I'm going to continue to make videos talking about how bad the hood is, how corrosive the hood is, how destructive the hood is, and how the hood is never going to be more than the hood while there's going to be other environments and cities and communities that are going to flourish and they're going to keep you in this money. Do you know during the Rona, the Hasidic Jews did not shut down their schools. Why were they able to do that? Because they had money. They had money. They were able to do what they wanted to do because they had money and community. Google it. Check it out. So for you hood folks, hey, bless your little hearts. Just bless your little hearts. That's all I got for you guys. Check out this next video.